Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Hoops Tax Forum. It, I'm Jeff Gramlich, uh, Professor of Accounting and Director of the Hoops Tax Institute at the Car Carson College of Business. It's my privilege and responsibility to provide educational opportunities to the public in keeping with WSU's land grant mission and the founding principles of the Hoops Tax Institute. One way I can do this is by hosting public lectures and seminars. I'm, I'm pleased to introduce Washington State Representative Ed Orca, our keynote speaker for tonight's program. He will present Pulling Back the Curtain on Taxes in Washington. Before he takes the stage, I'd like to share a bit of his background. Uh, Representative Orca was appointed to the Washington State House of Representatives in 2002. From 2002 to 2013, he represented the 18th district. Due to redistricting, he went on to represent the 20th district uh, and is currently serving his 12th term as state representative. It is the ranking member of the House Finance Committee, which considers issues relating to state and local revenues. He is also a member of the State Economic and Revenue Forecast Council. Ed advocates for policies that benefit families and communities. His legislative priorities include tax relief, economic policy and jobs, natural resources, property rights, and public safety. He is also a leader on, the tra on transportation issues, having served as the ranking member of the House Transportation Committee from 2013 to 2018. He still serves on that committee, advocating for local transportation solutions and the effective use of state gas tax revenue. Since earning his BS in forest management from the University of Idaho, Ed has made his living as a forestry consultant since 1990 and has owned his own consulting company since 2009. Please, please give a warm Cougar welcome to Representative Ed Orcutt. So I may be an Idaho vandal, but when we're not playing the Cougars, I'm rooting the Cougars. So go Cougs. Uh, actually, my high school, we were the Cougars too. So there's a, a fondness in my heart for, the, for Cougars everywhere, but uh, especially here at WSU, having spent six years here on the Palouse myself. So my slides are not particularly fancy. I'm not uh, very techno savvy. Um, so I sat down and uh, and got into uh, PowerPoint and uh, and it's pretty gonna be pretty basic slides. So uh, I'm not here to tell you what to think on tax policy, but I'm here to give you some background, some insights, and maybe some food for thought as you develop what your thoughts are on any particular tax or tax policy in general. So I just want to make a quick announcement. So if you send, if you have questions and they come to your mind, feel free to text them to this number. You'll have a chance if you want to speak up and I'll, I'll come around with a, with the microphone, but um, you can text to this number 509-906-4782. And I will, uh, ask the questions for you. Some people feel a little bit shy about asking. That if that's just fine, we'll get your question out there. Okay. All right. So first thing I wanted to do was to give you a little bit of the, the background on the way tax policy is made in the state, what committees uh, and what their responsibilities are uh, regarding tax policy. So in the Senate, we have ways and means. Uh, they do appropriations, which when you hear about the budget, we're talking about the operating budget. There are actually three budgets. Uh, there's the operating budget, the capital budget, and the transportation budget. Um, Ways and Means in the Senate has, op uh, has the appropriations. They do the revenue taxation, uh, and they also include capital budget. Transportation Committee is a separate committee um, from Ways and Means. In the House... We have the Finance Committee, which does revenue taxation, but we don't do the operating budget. That's done by Appropriations Committee. Uh, and then Capital Budget is its own committee uh, in the House. 
but we do also have a separate transportation committee. We actually meet the same time uh, as the Senate does. Uh, we meet in the afternoons from four till six, and we're meeting in the same time slot that they are, uh, which makes it kind of tricky if we have a bill over in, in uh, the transportation committee uh, because we've got to race over. We've got to leave a committee to go testify in another committee. But that's kind of the, the setup. So when if you're hearing about a tax policy bill for operating budget, general fund, it's going to be either in the Senate Ways and Means or the House Finance Committee. If it's uh, transportation related, it's going to be in uh, in the transportation committees in both chambers. So major taxes. Uh, these are basically general fund taxes. I will. I do have a slide at the end that talks about a, a few of the transportation taxes, but I'm going to focus mostly on uh, the ones that go into the general fund budget. General fund budget um, for this biennium, and we do them on a two-year basis. So it starts... July 1st of the odd year and goes through June 30th, two years later. So you hear about a 23-25 budget. That's the one we're in right now. It started uh, July 1st of 2023. It will end on June 30th of 2025, which is next year. When we get into the legislative session in 2025, January through April, we will be writing the biennial budget for uh, 25, 27. All of our budgets are biennial. So capital budget is a two-year budget. It's on that same time frame. Uh, transportation is the same way, two years uh, on that time frame. So here are some of the major taxes, and I will also uh, mention uh, the, the operating budget, $72 billion. $72 billion. When you get a minute, write that out. I want you to look at how big that number is. And when I tell you it's $72 billion, that's not all of it. That's the general fund state. There are also federal dollars and other non-general fund dollars that, that come into the budget. The actual total budget for two-year period to operate everything in the state, it's about $142 billion. $142 billion. Transportation is about $13 billion, and I think uh, capital budget is five or six billion dollars. Uh, so some of the major taxes, general fund, uh, is the sales and use tax. And I'll and I'll go through these real quick and then. I'll get into each, each one of these specifically. Uh, there's a sales and use tax, business and occupation tax, you'll hear it referred to as B&O, property tax, capital gains, real estate excise tax, which you'll hear it referred to as REIT, cannabis tax, and then there's public utility tax, that's in lieu of a B&O tax that we mentioned earlier, and insurance premiums tax, that's in lieu of a B&O tax as well. So the sales and use tax. First of all, everybody pretty well understands what the sales tax is, right? What's the use tax? Well, the use tax applies if you purchase something out of state and bring it back into Washington for use here in Washington. So where I live in Kalama, which is a little bit north of Vancouver, a lot of people will go and they'll shop in Oregon because what does Oregon not have? Sales tax. And when you see what the, what the amount of sales tax is, you'll know why people go and buy big ticket items in, in Oregon. When they bring those back, washers, dryers, TVs, refrigerators, whatever those big ticket items are, they're actually, there's actually a form they're supposed to fill out calculate the tax and remit that to the state of Washington. Not many people do. If you're a business owner, you do. And the reason why you do is because there's a pretty good chance you'll get audited. And if you haven't paid it, then you're gonna be on the hook for it, plus penalties, uh, plus interest. So state 
you see the state is uh, six and a half percent. You're saying, well, wait a minute. I just went and bought something downtown and I paid eight and a half or nine percent sales tax. Why did I, if the state sales tax is six and a half, why did I pay that much? It's because there's a local government um, aspect to that too. The counties, the cities, uh, there are certain other uh, special purpose districts, uh, transit districts, there are a number of one of those that can actually uh, add to the sales tax. Um, there's some public safety taxes that can be added, uh, two tenths of a percent or three percent or three tenths of a percent can be added uh, with voter approval for public safety. So that's how you get up there. And the local can be um, one to 4%. Um, I was looking through uh, a Department of Revenue report from last year, and they showed the lowest combined total at seven and a half, the highest combined at 10 and a half. Someone told me recently that 10.6 uh, is the highest, but uh, Click Attack County was at seven and a half percent. Uh, up in Snohomish County, Edmonds, uh, Snohomish, uh, some of the towns up there are at 10.5%. So you go into a store and you buy something for $100, $100 tack 10.5% on uh, for sales tax. There are some exemptions you'll see at the bottom of the screen. Uh, food, medicine, ag products, uh, there are a variety of things that can be exempt from that. And I'm going to touch back on that aspect here in a little while. Property tax. So there's regular levies. What the regular levies are, it's within the constitutional limit. The Constitution says that you cannot, in aggregate, tax more than 1% of the true and fair market value of the property. That equates to $10 per thousand of assessed valuation. If you have a $500,000 home and you have a $10 uh, limit, if your tax is $10, 500,000, so that's 500 thousands times $10 property tax bill would be $5,000 a year per year, okay? Some of that goes to the state. We're limited to 3.6, so $3.60 we're limited to. Cities and counties can make up uh, another 590. Uh, and if you add that up, that's nine and a half. So where's the other 50 cents? Well, there's a bunch of other districts that can can get into that. Uh, fire districts, uh, port districts, there are cemetery districts, diking districts. Um, if I listed them all, I'd be, we'd be at time. So I didn't want to list them all. Um, there's a limit. So there's two 1% limits. And the one mo people most hear about is the increase, the 1%. And sometimes you'll hear people refer to it as the 747. 1%. That was an initiative to the people to limit the growth rate to 1%. Now, we are under what's referred to as a budget-based tax system in our state. So what that means is any one of these governments, say, the, say a city, collects a million dollars from property tax. They are allowed to increase that by 1% each year. They increase it by 1%. They go look at what the assessor has for assessed valuation for their district, and then they calculate the rate. That rate is then applied to whatever valuation is on your specific property. In a rate-based system, a rate-based system, you would have a set rate, and that rate would continue if you if you had a, a rate of ten dollars, your house was five hundred thousand dollars, paid five thousand dollars. All of a sudden, it goes up to six hundred thousand. Then what happens? Your taxes go up. Under the budget-based system that we have, it's somewhat self-mitigating because they can only increase the total amount of tax they collect by one percent. So what ends up happening is the levy rate comes down. So that calculated rate gets lower and lower because valuations on property are going up much faster than the 1%. You'll often hear, and I hear this from 
fire districts uh, especially, they'll come in and they'll say, well, we used to have a dollar fifty. Our levy rate used to be a dollar fifty. It's down to a dollar twenty. We're losing money. You go look at what their actual collections were, and they went up by one percent. Now that doesn't include uh, uh, one other factor that I'm going to throw in here, just so you're aware of it. <clears throat> they also get new growth. So if a new factory comes in is built, um, they can they say it's a hundred million dollar facility. They'll take that $100 million, they will apply it, they will multiply by the previous year's levy rate, and they will add that in. So they get their total amount plus 1% plus the new growth. Okay? Everybody find this complicated, complicated so far? I've only touched the surface. Okay, it gets way more complicated and I won't get that deep into it. Um, but that's, that's what it, this is. So there's the 1% increase, and that's councilmanic, okay? So that means by a vote of whatever that legislative body is. So a city council, county commissioners, county council, they can just vote to take the 1%. There is a provision that allows them to get an increase of more than 1%, okay? They have to go out for voter approval. It's referred to as a lid lift because their lid is a 1% growth. But they can go out to the voters and say, hey, we need more than that. Fire districts have been very, very successful in doing this, uh, which is great for the fire districts. But what ends up happening is you now have turned it into a semi-rate-based system in that they're trying to take it back up to the, to the $1.50. So values go up, they hit the 1% limit. So the rate comes down, now they bring the rate back up. It's like it was a rate-based system, at least for the ones that are successful in passing the lid lifts. That's one of the, the ways that your, your property taxes typically increase is because of something voter approved. So it could be fire districts or a city or a county doing a lid lift or, remember I told you $10 per thousand is the, is the constitutional limit. That's the other 1%. $10 per thousand is 1%. You can go, so school districts are outside of the $10 limit. They can go out for levies or they can go out for bonds. And that's why you'll hear, you'll hear the term excess levies because it's in excess of that $10 limit. It's outside of that $10 limit. In 2007, they were given the ability to do that with a 50% simple majority vote. School district bonds still require, uh, as levies used to require, a 60% vote of the people. I believe that's a reasonable thing to do and it was put in place by the people in our constitution. Uh, and Effectively, what are you asking people to do if you're asking them to go above that $10, $10 limit? You're asking them to waive their right to not be taxed more than $10 per thousand. So you're asking them to waive their constitutional right and be taxed more than that. So that's why the 60% supermajority is there. Um, and it's, it's done to try and keep them from being taxed out of their homes. It was a big concern that happened back in the 30s. It's becoming a bigger and bigger concern now, partly because of the lid lifts, because of the school uh, levies uh, and school bonds. Uh, so people are seeing it. The other way that your property taxes can increase in a budget-based system, not only just that 1% that I mentioned, but if your property goes up in value faster than somebody else's property goes up in value, what ends up happening is some of the tax burden they had is now shifted over onto you. Because your value went up faster, you have a higher percentage of the valuation. And remember, we go, we calculate the rate and then apply that to whatever your property is. So that new rate is, is gonna be the same for everybody, but your valuation went up faster than somebody else's. 
So you're going to take on some of the burden that they had in property taxes. It's called a shift. And whenever we do anything with property taxes, and we do, and I am uh, guilty, I will, I will take credit for the ones that I do, um, because they're to help seniors, uh, disabled, uh, and disabled veterans. Uh, and we have been given permission by the voters to give those exemptions. But when we do that, when we give more people uh, more tax breaks on property, it does shift it to everybody else. And I, and I, I consciously recognize that when I take those votes. But I also recognize that the people of this state have said, we think that's, we think that's a good thing. We think it's good for those people. And so that's why we'll do it. Okay. Um, so I talked about the excess levies. So business and occupation tax. It's based on gross receipts. You bring in a million dollars and whatever rate you have, you apply it to the million dollars. Doesn't matter if you only made 100,000. Doesn't matter if you only made 50,000. Doesn't matter what your profit was. You are taxed on the gross amount, okay? There are few or no deductions or exclusions. Um, some cities also impose a, a local B&O tax and that can vary. I will get into some B&O tax rates here in, in a little while. Uh, capital gains tax. Um, the Supreme Court ruled that this is an excise tax. Um, I would argue that it's an income tax. Um, considering that the first number that you use in calculating your, uh, you know, what you do for tax comes off your IRS income tax form, and then there's an additional deduction that the state allows. Uh, don't freak out when you see it. It's the, the deduction we give is two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars, but it's it's tax on the increase in the value of the of the asset that you have at the time you sell it. So if you bought stock and you paid $200,000 for it and you sell it for a million dollars, that's $800,000 in gain. There are some deductions at the federal level. Um, obviously you take the 200,000 off your original, it's called the basis. You take that off, you take that, so you've got the $800,000 gain, and then you can deduct $250,000 out of that, and then you will be taxed at 7% on that. Um, the, the Supreme Court, State Supreme Court, ruled that it's an excise tax because it is a tax on the entirety of the sale, not on the net revenue. I'll let you decide whether that's a valid statement or not based on the facts that I just presented to you. Um, there are some exceptions, some exemptions, such as real estate. Now, if real estate is part of a business interest, um, that can actually uh, get included as well. But typically your home's not gonna be included in that. Um, certain retirement accounts, livestock, um, that's a pretty important one. Timber is another one. Uh, timber, not so much on this side of the mountains, but certainly on my side. So real estate excise tax. This one actually is an excise tax. This is a tax on the gross sale uh, of a property. Uh, and it's, um, it's tiered. Uh, it starts at 1.35 and can be as high as 3.5. Um, there's also additional rate that could be imposed by some local jurisdictions. Here's a key point down at the bottom. It is payable by the seller. The seller has a responsibility to pay that. But if you purchase that property and that seller does not remit that tax to the state, the buyer is going to become liable for it. it may sound like it's not fair, but if you can't get it out of, uh, if the state can't get it out of the seller, they're going to get it out of the buyer. Cannabis tax. Cannabis sales. Uh, were approved by Initiative 502. 
Um, the voters approved it. Uh, we were the second state in the nation to, to approve it. Uh, Colorado was the first. They beat us by an hour. They did it on the same night we did, but their polls closed an hour before ours. Uh, it's, it's collected by retailers uh, at the time of sale. When 502 was a, uh, originally implemented, it was taxed at 25% at three different transactions. So the producer to the wholesaler, wholesaler to retailer, retailer to customer, were all taxed at 25%. Um, they decided to just simplify and, and do it at 37% uh, one time. Um, there were some, uh, some retailers who were the wholesaler and the producer. In fact, a lot of the, the stores in our state actually operate that way. So it's easier to just do it one calculation one time rather than try to figure out what's the internal sale price that you're doing from yourself to yourself as a wholesaler to a producer to wholesaler and wholesaler to retailer. So it just went to um, a one-time 37%. Um, <clears throat> please text your questions to 509-906-4782. Think it's going to get snuck in another time, probably on me. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. But if you do have questions, uh, please feel free to text them. Um, if you have questions that you're having about any of these slides, don't be afraid to write them down because there is going to be time for questions at the end. So, in lieu of B&O taxes, the public utility tax applies to public service businesses. So, uh, railroads they don't pay a B&O; they pay a, a public utility tax. Water utilities, electric utilities, um, the rate is anywhere from uh, six tenths of a percent to 5.04 percent, depending on what industry. Insurance premiums tax, uh, it's also in lieu of B and O. Uh, it's uh, it's applied to the uh, insurance premiums, generally two percent, but foreign and marine trade insurance uh, is uh, 95 hundredths of a percent, so just under one percent. Now, you've probably heard people talk about tax breaks. Oh, the rich get tax breaks. Uh, businesses get tax breaks. Uh, we got to get rid of all these tax breaks that we have. Uh, so I, I want to talk about what tax breaks can be, what can be classified as a tax break. An exemption, that means you're just not, a, not subject to the tax or that particular activity is not subject to a tax. Um, deductions, you can reduce your taxable amount. It's like when you do your income taxes, uh, you get a standard deduction that you can deduct out of your total income uh, to get down to a net taxable. Um, credits, so a credit is a little bit different than a deduction. And I wanna make sure people understand that. A deduction, you deduct from your gross revenue to come up with a net revenue, and then you apply your tax to it. A credit is actually a dollar amount that is credited against the amount that you actually pay in tax. So one is, is kind of reducing what your taxable amount is going to be. Credits actually reduce your tax by that much. Uh, and then you'll hear about differential or preferential rates. I put preferential in, in parentheses, that's my personal bias. Um, I don't like the term preferential uh, because it sounds like uh, a buddy-buddy system that, uh, oh, well, we gave him a break because we liked him, or we gave her a break because we liked her, uh, or we liked the business, uh, and that's not the case. Uh, oftentimes, it just ends up being uh, different rates based on an activity type. So here are some of the different rates that you'll see um, for services, 1.5 to 1.75% of the gross revenue. So I'm a consulting forester that considers uh, to be service. So I would pay at the 1.5% rate. Um, there are some, the, some industries that are uh, that have a, a basically it's kind of like a surcharge. It's it's a higher rate. 
um, high tech sector. Uh, and that's supposed to go to, to fund um, some of our universities uh, for the tech programs. Uh, manufacturing is 0.484%. And that is 0.484%. You see my down here at the bottom, 0.4884, you multiply by 0 0.00484 uh, times your, your gross to calculate what your actual tax is. Um, so retailing is 0 0.471. Now, why are they different than anybody else? One of the reasons they're different is they are collecting and remitting sales tax. Now, who pays sales tax? You, the co consumer, does. But they're collecting it from you, and they're remitting it to the state. They've got the book work uh, for collecting and remitting. And oh, by the way, if they get audited and it was found out that they didn't collect as much sales tax as they should have, guess who pays it? Go into a retail outlet and look at how many people are in there, how many transactions are being done, even in a one hour period. Multiply that by the hours the store is open. How are they ever going to go back and identify who it was that they didn't collect the tax from? So they can't go back and find the customer and say, oops, we were supposed to charge you tax and we didn't. We need you to give it to us. That doesn't happen. The business now pays because the business didn't collect it. Uh, newspaper publishing is at 0.35. Manufacturing wholesaling of solar energy is at 0.275. Aluminum smelting, you don't really have to worry about this one. There are no aluminum smelters anymore. Um, and that one may actually come off the books sometime soon. Um, coming from an area where we used to have an aluminum smelter, kind of hate to see it even go off the books. Um, processing of perishable meats, 0.138%. That's just a few. There are a number of them, um, and there are different reasons for those. So reasons for tax breaks or differential rates um, to attract retain activity so one of the one of the uh, incentives that we have which was passed in the 1990s was a manufacturing uh, equipment sales tax exemption so they don't have to pay sales tax on the equipment that they put into the factory why did we do that we did that to entice people to come and build their manufacturing facilities here. Uh, we have uh, tax breaks that we give to, uh, to data centers. And if you have questions about whether or not tax incentives work, let me tell you this little story. I think it was in 2007, that exemption was about to expire. It had one year left on it. Five different companies looked at our state. We're looking at locating in our state. A billion dollars of potential investment in our state. They looked at the tax incentive. It had one year left. And they said, we don't know if it's going to get renewed. It's too much of a risk of it not being renewed for us to locate here. One's in Oregon, one's in Nevada, I think one's in Texas. I'm not sure where the other two went. We got zero. Tax policy does matter in where people locate their businesses. Tax policy also matters where they expand their business. And you'll hear people say, well, if we take their tax break away, they're not going to go away. Well, maybe they won't shut down their hundred million or 500 million or billion dollar facility. But when they expand, where are they going to expand? Are they going to expand here or are they going to expand somewhere else? Certainly going to look somewhere else, aren't they? They may still do it here, but they're likely to look, look somewhere else. And there's a pretty good chance that they could go. So to be more competitive with other states, 
uh, to mitigate higher costs of operating in our state. We have higher wages. We have higher cost of living. We have more regulations. can take longer to get permits. It's a variety of things. All of those things drive costs. If we lower the tax, it might be enough to get them to come, still pay the higher wages, still put up with our, uh, our stringent regulations, still provide benefits. And guess what? If we get tax revenue we wouldn't have gotten because they don't come in tax-free. They're paying tax on something in this state. So um, the other thing, what, what I mentioned with, uh, with the retailing is compensate for collection and remittance expense. Um, uh, you can reduce uh, relative burden, um, equalize between a high profit versus a low profit business. So if you have really, really high operating costs, one business may make a million dollars, may gross a million dollars, but they only net a hundred, hundred thousand dollars. Another one could make a million dollars and net 500,000. They could be 50% profit. So it gives a, a, a little more consistent consistency and rate uh, between those and how much of a tax burden each of them take on as a result. Um, tax policy can also deter activity. So I've talked about how it can incent, can also deter activity, and sometimes it is used to deter activity. And I know probably the second item that I have there is not one I should show on a college campus, but so smoking, drinking, uh, and radioactive waste disposal. That's actually got the highest B&O tax at 3.3%. Um, if you look at, at the uh, cigarette tax, uh, it's extremely high. I remember when it was $1.40. Uh, the last time I remember it was 302.5 cents per pack. $3, two cents and a half per pack, per pack. Uh, and then alcohol taxes are, are pretty, pretty high as well. Um, so who benefits from tax breaks? And you'll hear this. So the, the total exemptions, preferential rates, 786, sorry, I meant that um, to be up on up top. So it's, uh, it's lining up different than what I, what I wrote it. So 786, if you look at the uh, uh, tax incentives report, 786 tax exemptions in there. And people get caught up on, on business, 278 uh, tax incentives out of the 786. So who else get them? So agriculture gets 63. Individual, 93 of our tax incentives or tax breaks are for individuals. Remember I talked about property tax? You're taxed on current use. So if you have a, a house and you're near an industrial area, they don't tax your house or the land that your house sits on based on industrial values. They based on current use residential values. That's actually a tax break. Trust me, you don't wanna pay industrial taxes. Uh, taxes on industrial property. The difference there is valuations, is how it's valued. Whether you're in a homeowner or an industry, if you are in the same group of taxing districts, you will be taxed the same rate, but your valuations will be grossly different. Your valuation may be 500,000 on your home. It might be 10, 100, 500 million on the business next door. Uh, so nonprofits, there's 95 uh, of the exemptions go to them. Interstate commerce, there's 22. Some of those are because the feds prohibit us from taxing. Uh, and then government, there's 82. <clears throat> so the budget considerations of tax breaks, 
Uh, they lower the tax rate for all businesses in a, in a specific sector. So how many of you heard about the Boeing tax break? Okay. It's not a Boeing tax break. It was aerospace tax break. So when, when the tax rate was lowered to 0 0.2904 for B&O tax, Boeing was not the only company that, that did that. A lot of suppliers in our state supply into Boeing. All of them receive it too. It's within a particular sector. You can't just pick one company and leave other companies in that same sector out. So that's the way it's done in our state. Now, if, if others already operate in the state, you can end up reducing collections by doing a, a, a tax incentive. But if you're worried that you're gonna lose those businesses, you might wanna take a little bit of a loss now rather than to lose, lose them entirely. So you, you may have some foregone revenue um, some foregone revenue, when you look at the, the, uh, the study and it tells you how much the value of the tax breaks are, it also tells you that not all of those uh, tax breaks are money that's, that can be realized by the state. If you took that property tax exemption away, the state, the city, the county, none of them would get any more money because we're in a budget-based system. What it would do is it would shift burden from everybody else over onto whoever the tax incentive was taken from. Um, so, like I said, it's it's not a revenue loss on property tax breaks. Um, effects of tax incentives, um, they can increase direct um, state and local government revenue, uh, property sales, B&O, REIT. You may give a tax break in one of those but you're still taxing in all those other categories and probably still taxing in the one you give a break in. You're just not taxing as much. Uh, increased indirect revenue. So when that business comes in, they are, they are doing business with other businesses that are already in the area, increasing their business. That ends up uh, resulting in uh, a number of entities doing better, having more tax revenue, paying into the state and the local governments. So they attract uh, business. Tax breaks definitely do. Uh, I've talked with my EDC in Cowlitz County. Uh, I've talked to them about 20 years ago. And the manufacturer sales tax exemption uh, that was passed in the 1990s had already brought in 2,000 jobs into Cowlitz County. If not for that tax incentive, those jobs would not be there. Uh, and there have been a lot more since then. I just don't have an update on that number. Um, so the, the bottom line there is 1.5%. So if you wanted to take manufacturing from 0.484 to 1.5, that's great. But if you lose all your manufacturing, you'll now collect 1.5% of $0 is zero revenue. Um, some trends. So just if you think this is something new and your people are talking about them and, oh my God, there's this onslaught of tax incentives and it's a new thing. It's not. The first tax incentive in this state, there were four of them in 1854. That's when we became a territory. We broke away um, the Oregon Territory, Washington, and we broke off into Washington Territory. Most in a single year was in 1935. There were 43 of them in that year. And if you hear about Revenue Act collections, Revenue Act was part of that. The peak decade from 2000 to 2009, there were 172 other highs. The 1980s, the 1990s, the 2010s, there were 99 to 105 per decade. So it's nothing new. It's been going on for a long time. Uh, again, please, please text your questions. Yeah, to Jeff. now would be a good time to ask some questions. If anybody has any. I've got a couple of slides I can, left. I can walk around. But, Jeff, I got a couple slides okay. left. I'll get through real quick, if that works out. Uh oh. Get that back up in just a second. All right. Maybe it would be a good time to ask a question. I have one. Go ahead. Um, the city of Pullman is is located in in uh, an area that is not a high growth area. Uh, we are experiencing 
three four percent inflation and this the city government is facing financial difficulty trying to trying to keep up with paying the bills when they're limited to a one percent increase do they need to go and and go because they're do they need to go to the voters to get a lid lift? Is that the only way for them to pay their bills? So I think it would be interesting if there was a little more context in the question. What has their, their budget done over the last 10 years? Here's the reason why I ask. It's because property tax is not their only revenue source. Right. So they have sales tax. Uh, they have utility taxes. Uh, anybody's water power bill gone down? No. And it's a percent of what your what your bill is. Um, sales tax, uh, the price of items have gone up. One of the reasons why um, in when we had the high inflation of 9%, state revenues went up. The reason why state revenues went up was when the price of goods went up and we apply a set percent to that, our revenues went up. We saw a big uh, boost in our revenue as a result of inflation. We have a 1.6%, sorry. We have a 1.6% assessment rate on the house, at least I do. And that's because of the school bonds, the hospital gets a piece of the action. So we're well above the 1% rate. Moreover, we've had relatively high inflation rates on our houses. So I can tell you what mine went up last so year. property rate, taxes. So I don't think we're budget-wise in tough shape here so but the, but the issue on property taxes and i will be I, I will admit to this because we have a budget-based system if you have a low growth area and you are limited to one percent you're not going to see a lot of growth in your property tax revenue but you should be seeing growth in the sales tax revenue because prices have gone up that should compensate for some of it but if they need more from the property tax, then they could go out to the voters and say, look, this is what we need. We need more money for police. We need more money for uh, employee salaries. We need more money for whatever other function that we're doing. Now, remember, utilities are supposed to be kept separate from their general fund. So utility money is supposed to go, if you're paying for, um, for water, sewer, um, that money is supposed to go specifically to water and sewer. So they can't take that money. Or they're not supposed to take that money, put it into their general fund. Their utility tax money can go there, though, and all their sales tax does. So that's what they have to look at. What has their growth rate in their revenue been? Has it kept up with inflation or nearly kept up with inflation? But if it hasn't, then then they may need to take a look at at doing a 1%, doing what I refer to as a, a lid lift when I said it earlier. So this is just, <clears throat> sometimes you'll hear um, a couple of my uh, colleagues who happen to be from the opposite party from me uh, talk about all these tax incentives and we've got so many of them and they're not getting reviewed. First of all, they are. Um, the Joint Legislative Audit Review has professional auditors. They audit a number of these every year and then it goes to the Citizens Commission on Tax Preferences. That's why I used the term earlier, preference. Put it in parentheses because I don't like the term. But um, that's that's why I put it on there, uh, is because of that uh, the committee that does the reviews. So is it partisan? Well, so here's how many uh, tax incentives were passed from 95 to 1990, from 91 to 94, 95 to 98, 99 to 2001, and 2002 to 2023. I picked those numbers for a very specific reason. 85 to 90, I wasn't in the uh, in the state yet, so I don't know what the makeup of the legislature was, House and Senate, but I'm pretty sure the House was a Democrat majority. Um, I know it was Democrat majority 91 to 94. In 94, the Republicans took over the House and the Senate. So 95 to 98, I know that we had Republican majorities and we had 64 of them. In 99 to 2001, the House was in a tie. 49 Democrats, 49 Republicans. Um, I don't remember what the, what the Senate was. And then 2002 to 23, I put that in there. That's the exact, actually 2000 uh, to 
to current, 2002 to current, is how long I'd been in office. I came into office when the Democrats got the majority back. And so in this time frame, the House majority has been Democrat the whole time. And it's ranged from 62 to 50 Democrats, which 50 to 48 would be the majority when they're at 50. 62 to 36 would be the majority when they're there. This whole time frame, and the reason why I started in 1985, is we've had a Democrat governor the whole time. Now, I'm not pointing fingers. What I'm saying is don't let others point fingers. Democrats and Republicans both have supported these tax incentives. You hear the term loophole once in a while when it comes to tax incentives. They're not loopholes. They were passed by the House, a majority in the House, majority in the Senate, and signed into law by a governor. So you know that both parties at some point have been in favor of these things. And quite often, uh, they're passing with some pretty good majorities, bipartisan majorities in any given year. So if somebody tries to imply that, you know, only one side likes these, both sides do it. Um, and we do it for a reason. And it's for the reasons that I showed earlier. And with that, I will conclude my presentation and we'll go strictly to questions. Anybody have a question? I noticed that you didn't talk about one right behind you. Yeah. Yes. Pena. Well, just out of curiosity, is there a way for government to detect those businesses who try to avoid taxes? Uh, I'd like to give a context because when I uh, go to some of the restaurant, some of the Chinese restaurants, they'll say, oh, okay, if you pay cash, you just pay the face value of the uh, things you ordered, you don't pay tax on it. And I bet they don't even record this transaction. So there's no record on this transaction. So is there a way for government to detect this type of business who try to do this? Call the Department of Revenue. Yeah. They would love to know about these people. <laughs> um, and it's funny you should say that because there actually was, they call them skimmers. Or zappers. Zappers, yeah, exactly. Um, zappers where they could go and you would have say three and Department of Revenue figured this out because they went out to dinner and there to lunch and there were three of them. And when they looked at their receipt after they left, it only recorded two meals. And so they started investigating and they found out that these zappers were there and they could put transactions into their machine and it would hide the transaction. In your case, you're saying they're not collecting the sales tax. In this case, they were, but they were hiding the transaction and the tax collected. So B&O tax was not being collected on, on that revenue and the sales tax was being collected, but kept. Stolen. Stolen. So yeah, I'm a little embarrassed that I, that I got the name of them wrong, that I, I call them skimmers instead of zappers because I actually wrote the legislation to fix that. And we were the first state to put somebody in jail for using zappers. But we do have auditors that go out and, and audit businesses and they'll just, they'll pick a business, go audit. Question over there. What you should do if you wanna see Jeff run is have one question over here, then one over there, and then one back there. So one of the things you had like mentioned was like they go after the business of the they aren't collecting the sales tax. So is it illegal for them to not collect the sales tax if they intend to pay it? Like could a business make a strategy out of like having even prices that they pay like the sales tax for them? Yeah, they can they can actually pay the sales tax. So you when you hear those ads and we'll hear them um and, and especially in our area, because I'm so close to the, the Portland market and we have people go down there uh, and they'll say, we'll pay the sales tax for you. Uh, but what they've done is they've factored that into the price. But yeah, they better be reporting that, that they better be uh, remitting that sales tax to the state or they're gonna be in trouble. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about where you said, um, Differential taxes are not a partisan issue, which I agree. Um, but there is 
there are partisan differences in which types of differential taxes are preferred. Can you talk about the areas where there is strong bipartisan support? Where where do the sides kind of really line up on on things and, and where are there some differences across parties? Um, so one of the areas that, that we've had strong bipartisan support, uh, senior property tax exemption, seniors, disabled, veterans, um, those are typically getting unanimous support or near unanimous support. Um, everybody agrees that somebody that's on a fixed income, a senior citizen, um, having their property tax skyrocket is is extremely difficult uh, on them. So that's one area that we have uh, tremendous uh, support. Um, you'll, I mean, most of the tax incentives are going through with fairly good majorities. So, um, I mean, there are some, I mean, I had one, I was trying to tack onto the aerospace bill, uh, which was actually done in a special session. Um, I don't remember what year that was that we did that, 2007 or nine or somewhere in there um, that we did that. Um, there was a helicopter company um, that was in Portland that was looking to move out of, out of Portland, out of the space they were in. And they were looking at uh, a property in Kelso, in Kelso, Washington. Um, at the airport, um, but they wanted to be included because it said fixed wing aircraft. Well, helicopters are rotary wing, right? So I tried to get language included, but they had written the aerospace tax incentive so tight, I couldn't amend it on. And they may not have taken it even if they could. So that's one, one thing too is we're not Congress in more ways than one. Um, but we have limits on what we can amend onto a bill. Whatever we amend uh, onto a bill has to fit within uh, the title of the bill. So if you had a bill that was um, extending tax incentives to uh, fixed wing aerospace, you can't put a helicopter one on. Uh, whereas in Congress, they could hang that on. Uh, plus they could hang on something from healthcare, something from education, um, something from manufacturing. They could do all kinds of different things, so. Hi, so in Washington, if I understand correctly, the property tax is assessed on the fair market value of your home, for instance. Is that correct? Home and land, yes. Okay, home and land. So then how is that value determined? The state determines it every year? Do they just go to Redfin and Zillow and all of those things? County assessors do it. Um, so they will go out and they can't go to every home every year. So they pick areas within the county and they rotate around. And so um, a couple years ago was Kalama, 37% increase in my valuation in one shot. Yeah, went from about 300,000 to 400,000 in one shot. Yeah. yeah. Seniors do have an exemption. Seniors do have an exemption. If, okay. if they are below a certain um, a, a certain threshold in their income, they qualify to have uh, to be exempted out of um, excess levies. Sometimes even out of some of the uh, regular levies, um, and they can have um, valuations frozen. Okay. Nobody else can have valuations frozen, so your valuation is uh, is going to go up. So my taxes went up that year because my valuation went up faster than people in other parts of the county. Is there any but it's the county assessor that goes out and does it in each of the 39 counties. Oh. Is there any type of extension for the period of time that's allowed to pay since a somewhat unexpected bill might come? So <clears throat> they, they assessed my property this year. It went down $800 out of 400000 after it went up one hundred and seven. dollars $1,000. Um, so they have, they have appraised it based on January 1st of this year. I will not pay taxes until April of 2025. So April and October of 2025 is when I'll actually pay taxes on that based on the valuation as of January 1st. That's another issue too, is it has to be equitable. So if you have two homes in same area, same condition, um, they have to be appraised the same. The assessed valuation has to be the same. Um, 
if they're in different neighborhoods, you have a different view, uh, you have different amenities, that can change the valuation, but otherwise those values have to be the same. Ed, thank you so much for making the trip over to our side of the state. <laughs> we have some, um, some Cougar swag for you right. and um, look forward to more visiting. Um, if anybody's interested in contacting uh, Representative Orcutt, feel free to reach out to any of your professors or, or, or to me, jeff.gramlich at WSU, and I'll get you in contact. You can also find him on, online. But thank you all for coming, and um, we'll see you at the next forum.